on to hear from our keynote speaker from the evening, for the evening, who is Millie Dresselhaus. And uh, I've been hearing all sorts of great stories at the dinner table, but I think I'm sworn not to repeat all of them. I, we, we get, but, but you can ask, but you can, after she's done, you can raise your hand and ask all sorts of questions. So anyway, Millie is, has been a, a professor of physics and double E at MIT since 1967. She's won all, all sorts of awards. She has 12 honorary doctorates. She's the treasurer of the National Academy of Sciences and I believe was president of the American Physical Society. Is that right? Yes. So she is certainly one of the most senior women in science in America and she has agreed, maybe in the world, and has agreed to come and talk to us. And uh, we'll please welcome Dr. Mildred Dresselhaus. Well, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here tonight. This is a, a, a marvelous celebration for Grace Hopper and women in computing. It's a celebration for both at the same time. Uh, I, I guess I'm here as uh, Al Gore's pinch hitter. <laughs> uh, I, I, Anita wanted to have somebody who wasn't a computer scientist to do the uh, after dinner speech. And, uh, but unfortunately, Al Gore is busy up in Cambridge today. We interchanged uh, locations <laughs> for the evening. And he's up at Harvard getting uh, an honorary degree. This is his 25th anniversary, you know, for graduation, special event. So uh, I had to do the honors, I, I suppose. And so you'll have to put up with me. I think that it's a great idea to get women together uh, to celebrate something like this uh, uh, when we're at a, a meeting. Well, I, I don't know about computer science meetings because this is really the first one I've, I've ever attended. <laughs> uh, but I know, I know about physics meetings. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, you see, ver you see women once in a while, but uh, they're not very evident. And uh, to get all of them together at one time and to see all the wonderful things they do, you really get an impression that they are doing many wonderful things. And uh, and the other aspect of it is you get the broad picture of a field. Uh, recently, the mathematicians, I guess they beat you by a few months, they had their uh, first all-women mathematicians meeting. And uh, I was asked to make some remarks at that one also. <laughs> and, and it was great trepidation, you know, I'm not a mathematician either, so what am I going to say? And. Uh, but I, 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 that was a Saturday, so it was a little bit more um, leisurely for, for me, and I, I, I sat through a few, few talks. So I heard about wavelets and uh, <laughs> knot theory and uh, chaos, I guess we had, and uh, <laughs> um, uh, fractal theory. No, this was really pretty good. I, I, I thought I didn't know anything at all, and I sat there and I could even make it out. It, it didn't sound so different from physics. <laughs> so that was okay. But uh, uh, in all seriousness, this uh, meeting is different from the mathematicians in two main respects. One is the magnitude, and the order of magnitude is, is one order of magnitude more uh, in, in numbers. And the second aspect that's different is that uh, they had, well, about half the people were my age. <laughs> And uh, uh, they didn't have so many young people, and here the average age is about 25. And it's, it, it, it's really wonderful to see so many young people and budding uh, uh, future leaders of the field. So this is uh, what I, I think is, are the two main differences and very important differences. Well, uh, when Anita Borg invited me to speak, I, I had some difficulty in figuring out what the title subject matter of my talk would be because I'm not a computer scientist. So I said, well, what could I add to this meeting? I thought maybe to start with a few anecdotes uh, about Grace Hopper. 
uh, because she is the name of Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing, so maybe say something. And uh, I didn't know her well. I, I only met her after she retired. And uh, she's the age of my mother, so there's a slight age difference as well. Uh, but we had some things in, in common. Um, I met her through the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, uh, she was inducted as the second woman ever to join National Academy of Engineering, and I was the third. <laughs> and uh, she was elected in 1973, and I was elected in 1974. So, uh, you know, it was close together, so I got a chance to, to meet her. And, uh, but our interactions were not strong. Uh, uh, but shortly thereafter, I got to know her brother real well. And through her brother, I learned a lot about Grace. And I want, because <laughs> you always learn lots of anecdotes and, and things that you should know about through the kid brothers. <laughs> so uh, maybe I'll start out with this. Uh, uh, her brother, Roger Murray, uh, was a professor at, uh, at the business school at Harvard. That sounds like a very different thing from what Grace was doing, but not really, because they both love numbers, and they got the numbers from mom. And that's often a good way to get your roots. And I'll tell a little bit about that. Uh, we were both on, on the board of a mutual uh, fund company, and he was a guru of mutual funds. And when I joined that, I joined that board to, to be an advisor about trends of science. That was my role on the board. And he was uh, a guru on mutual funds. So, and this is my first introduction to uh, uh, financial management. So I, I tried to be a good student, and I learned a few things. And now I'm actually doing it, being treasurer of the National Academy. So it, everything works out good in the end. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Grace Hopper. I, I understand that she's been covered, uh, but maybe I'll have a few anecdotes that, that haven't yet surfaced. Uh, she was born in 1906. I guess you heard that. So that's uh, almost a century ago in New York City. And uh, what I hear from Roger was that she, among maybe more than anybody else in the family, was very inquisitive. Now, to be a scientist or maybe a computer scientist as well, uh, that's the first thing. You have to be inquisitive. And uh, so there was Grace. Uh, the oldest of three, she had a sister, and then Roger was the baby brother, and she was the one that was taking everything apart. And uh, so it started out with taking clocks apart. And as a child, I mean, th these stories were so vivid that I heard about them 70 years later, uh, that Grace was very good at taking things apart, and then surprisingly she found out it wasn't quite so easy to put them together again. <laughs> But she had a nice mom that didn't uh, mind. And um, well, there was some punishment, but it wasn't as severe as it might have been. And uh, there was a little bit of encouragement, and, uh, uh, as well as uh, maybe a slap or two. And, uh, what came out of this eventually, after taking their first crystal radio apart and uh, not being able to put it together and went on and on like this, uh, uh, Mom decided that mathematics was a good thing for Grace <laughs> to learn. And, uh, but it wasn't easy for a girl to learn mathematics back in, what was this, 1915, roughly the time World War I. And so she sent her to a, a private girls' school in New York City. Uh, and after private girls' high school, she enrolled in Vassar College to study math and physics. Anita, did you cover this? No, this, this, I have some new material here. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I, I didn't want to be totally repetitious. And uh, uh, an interesting thing about Grace Hopper is she didn't enter computer science until she was uh, a, a rather mature woman. She, uh, uh, after completing her bachelor's degree in math and physics, she went on to Yale where she did her graduate study, eventually getting uh, a PhD uh, degree in 1934. And, uh, but in the meantime, in uh, 1931, 
while she was a, a PhD student, she was uh, uh, on the faculty at Vassar College where she had been an undergraduate and simultaneously was doing teaching. That, when I, even when I went to, uh, I was an undergraduate, that was re very common. People, when they did their graduate study, they would have a job because they couldn't support themselves. So they did simultaneous stuff. And uh, eventually, then she got her PhD, and but uh, by that time, she was already uh, traveling up the tenure route at Vassar College. And uh, she remained at Vassar College for a rather long time. Uh, in the early 40s, so this is 10 years later, uh, Grace Hopper takes some courses at NYU. And, uh, and uh, what came out of that eventually uh, uh, was a job at Barnard, and she stepped backwards instead of, she became a system professor again in mathematics. Uh, and she was there only a very short time and uh, uh, because the war broke out and she wanted to do something for the country and uh, uh, so she joined the Navy and became a wave as what they called the women in the Navy at that time. And uh, she was assigned to the Bureau of Ordnance Computer Project at Harvard. And uh, what they had there was Mark I, that was a computer. I think you've heard about the computer uh, this morning. And she was assigned to uh, uh, develop some software. She was working on compilers and that sort of thing uh, uh, on the Mark uh, I. And she was doing that uh, as the end of the war uh, drew to a close. And uh, by that time, she was 40 years old. And this is really her introduction to, she said she was the third programmer in the United States, either sex, and she was very proud of that. So that gives you a sort of a scale of when computer science started as a field. Uh, she loved it so much that she didn't return to Barnard or, or Vassar or any of these places. She, she remained on, uh, on at Harvard for a few years. And then in uh, 1949, she joined industry and remained in industry, computer science industry, until she retired, Univax Berry Rand Corporation. Uh, but her interest in the Navy remained. Uh, in 1946, at the age of 40, she was retired out because you get retired out after a while. Uh, but she never really retired out very far, and she kept coming back. <laughs> and uh, she kept coming back until she was 80 years old. And uh, she, the last time she was retired out from the Navy uh, was in 1986, at, as I said, at the age of 80. And for the last three years, she was the oldest member of the Navy, man or female. Uh, uh, the, old, the next oldest person that was above her in seniority was Admiral Rickover, <laughs> who retired in 1983. I guess you've heard about Admiral Rickover in the nuclear navy. So I guess the, uh, what that tells us is that longevity has something to do with interest in science. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me say a few things that I learned from Roger Murray and also from Grace uh, that were special about her. I'll, I'll just highlight a few things. I think some of these have already been covered. Uh, one thing about uh, Grace was that she didn't want to be thought of as being different, although everybody that met her immediately said she was unique. And <laughs> But she wanted people to think that she was where she was because she was good at what she did. And it wasn't that she was asking for favors or wanted favors or special consideration, but she was in the field, and Roger makes this very clear, that she was li living in a dream world of her own, and she chose computer science, or it could have been math or physics, because there was some objective criterion to evaluate the quality of her work. And she would, he says that she never would have made it in business, although the people knowing her in computer science say she was an awfully good salesman. <laughs> well, uh, let me say another thing about Grace. Uh, I, I made some comments that she wanted to be taken for what she was, but she was a rather kind person and, uh, and thoughtful of people. She made quite a lot of money in public speaking. She was invited to give lots of talks. And most of the money that she made, she uh, gave to charities. And uh, much of this to people that uh, were disadvantaged in the Navy. So she was a thoughtful person. I don't think this is very widely known. But I wanted to say something about that side of her. Uh, Grace Hopper was not intimidated by anybody, uh, man, woman, 
Navy admiral or anybody. She had her own way of doing things, and uh, she wasn't going to be bamboozled by anybody. And in fact, she should have been, or should have had much difficulty about insubordination. As you know, in the military, you have to take orders and follow orders, and she was part of the military establishment, but Grace was not one to take orders. And, uh, but she was a woman of action and knew how to get things done. And that was, uh, this is something that's very important, I think, in every field, whether it's uh, uh, science, business, or computer sciences. Uh, you're evaluated eventually on what you accomplish, and so she was good at getting things done. And uh, sometimes getting things done meant going absolutely against the rules, and she thought that was just fine. <laughs> and uh, one of the legacies to her is a bridge in uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, that g goes between over some large expanse of land over a big lagoon. It's kind of a big bridge. And there's an epitaph on it that says to Grace Hopper. And what it says, it's easier to apologize than to get permission. <laughs> and that's sort of, I, I'll repeat that. <laughs> it was a delayed reaction. <laughs> it's easier to apologize than to get permission. And uh, she, that was her, her way of doing things. I, I think that people that work with her found that rather characteristic. I think you've heard about, about the quote about the computer bug, so I won't do that one again. She was working, uh, uh, as you know, in this Mark I machine that was a huge machine. Uh, computers at those times had vacuum tubes, you know, none of our fancy semiconductor electronics, so it was big stuff. And um, there was a little bug that was caught into it, and uh, that happened just when the computer went on the fritz, and uh, so that got the name computer bug. I, I didn't say this very well, I'm sure Anita t told that story much better. But uh, uh, let me uh, tell another story. I don't know if this one is, is true, but she's uh, credited uh, <laughs> with introducing the word computer software. Is that right? Somebody correct me if that's wrong. And it happened uh, in, well this is the date that was given, so I'll, I'll quote here. Uh, this is year 1950. And so she was uh, working uh, at the precur precursor of Sperry Rand. It had a different name at that time. I uh, don't remember. Uh, it's, it was called Eckerd Mowgli uh, uh, Computers Corporation. That's the predecessor of Sperry Rand. And uh, they had some meeting there, uh, and it was all men and grace. And uh, she, he, she said, I've been coming to these damn meetings for some time now and listening to all of you men tell me about your fine hardware and I think it's about t time I tell you about my software. <laughs> and that's supposed to be the quote that started software. I don't know if it's true, but it sounds pretty good. <laughs> well, you can tell it to your classes now and your, and your buddies <laughs> that the name software comes from a woman, <laughs> woman computer scientist. Uh, Grace Hopper was much honored for her work. She had 35 honorary degrees. She really chalked them up. And she was the first and maybe the only woman ever to have received the National Medal of Technology. I don't know of another one. And she received it in 1991 from President Bush. And uh, it was for COBOL and whatever, all that, all that stuff. Uh, now, uh, See, not being a computer scientist, I just say all that stuff, and you, and you fill in the blanks for me. That makes it easy. I, I want to make a, a serious comment looking back on her life, and this is a kind of remarkable thing, more remarkable to me than to you, uh, uh, because Grace Hopper started her career in computer science as a middle-aged, mid-career person. She was in, like 40 years old when she started in computer science, and she worked in this field from its inception, basically, uh, as we know it today, until the time it became a mature field. And there are very few people that are in any field. Physics isn't like that. If physics was already mature, you know, it goes back to, I don't know, 
Newton, Isaac Newton, and <laughs> whatever, you know, it's, uh, it, you, there aren't people or, uh, today, well, we could say maybe the quantum theory, but even that, is, it's hard, hard to say in a lifetime that, that you live from, from the inception to the maturity. And, and Grace did that, and, and she, she saw this whole big expanse of computer science. I think that's an interesting thing. I think that's a nice thing to say to young people, that there are fields out there, and I don't know what it is, it's not, not computer science for you because computer science is now mature, but the challenge for you is to find your own little niche and you know, let that grow into a big uh, tree and mushroom blossom into some important new thing. <laughs> so that's a challenge to you. Well, when I, when I started out, uh, uh, the age of the young people uh, here, um, I, I had the opportunity to grow with uh, semiconductor physics when, when it was at, at its very inception. But, you know, that's only a small piece of physics. It's different than computer science, which is the whole field. And uh, so th there were things out there just like, like I had the opportunity to start in a field at its inception. It's nice to find a field at, at its inception and go with it, ride the, the crest. And, uh, that's really great. Uh, in preparing for this talk, I thought I'd get some numbers, because I also love numbers. I mean, you're not the only people that love numbers. I like them, too. <laughs> and uh, so I uh, did a little, little homework to find out how computer science compares to physics, because that's the one I know best. And uh, so I, I went and asked our administrators at MIT, and then I called up a few other schools. I See, women in science, you get a chance to be on everybody's advisory committee. So <laughs> I have friends at, uh, besides MIT, I have Stanford and, and Berkeley and Caltech, and it goes on and on from there. But I, I just, uh, I stopped after two because the data came out the same. I, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now, I, I, realize, I realize as a scientist that's very poor science. <laughs> but. Uh, today, uh, uh, I got the same numbers from people uh, during the day, so I wasn't so far off. <laughs> and 20% uh, of the undergraduates uh, in, in computing si computer science are women at the undergraduate level. And uh, a remarkable thing happens, th and this is very unique to computer science because it's the only field of science that has this. Going down from master's through PhD, I'll give you the MIT numbers, I'll give you the Stanford numbers, they're the same, uh, is the MS it goes from 20 to 18 to 19. So what that tells me is that, that all the way through the pipeline, once you get into the, the, the program at the bachelor's level, women stay with it. If they, if they go through the bachelor's degree, and that, that is very different from all other fields of science. Women drop out proportionally much more than men in, in all other areas of science. Uh, it, it's true. No, you disagree? What field is it? Hmm? Bad science. Bad science. Okay. I, so so th this is a challenge to the other schools. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> well, I was impressed by those figures because we don't have those figures in the, uh, quite that, that way in the other fields at, at MIT or Stanford. So that's maybe... Okay, not enough homework. <laughs> Improvement for next time. But anyway, I at least in, in those two departments, uh, there is a, a, a constant flow. And uh, I, I know at, at MIT now we uh, had, um, well, with 20%, that, that gives you quite a few PhDs graduating every year. And uh, I know that the first hundred years of electrical engineering at MIT, when computer science and electrical engineering were, were the same department for the first hundred years of, uh, of electrical engineering, uh, computer science was still part of electrical engineering. We graduated less than 10 women in a hundred years. So, so this is a very big improvement. I was there at the 100th anniversary, and I remember those ghastly figures. <laughs> so we've made a, long, a, a lot of improvement. I think we have a, a, a ways to go to, uh, to meet uh, Nico uh, uh, uh dream of 45%. But uh, uh, with the undergraduates uh, in science and engineering that we have now at MIT, I'm very pleased that we, we're breaking now the 40% mark. And that, that is uh, uh, really uh, breaking new ground. 
and some of them will study computer science. <laughs> But uh, I think that you should bear one thing in mind, and this is a serious thing for the, the workshops uh, on, on Saturday, and, and uh, I have some notions about why this may be, uh, but the probability uh, once a woman is in science uh, and engineering that she uh, uh, goes into computer science is about 60%. Of, uh, of, of the whole science and engineering field. Maybe I should repeat that again so it's clear. Uh, we have a certain pool of people, women, going into science and engineering. So we'll take the norm of that and the probability of, of that the segment of, of that science and engineering, that big pool that, that uh, is computer science, is much less probable that a woman goes in than some other field, than the mean field. Now you didn't, Barbara didn't like that yet. <laughs> didn't understand that. <laughs> Women are less likely to go into computer science than other fields of science and engineering, and, and the scale factor is 0 0.6. <laughs> okay, uh, now that I've made that clear. <laughs> uh, I make a very few comments about uh, maybe some general uh, points about improving, uh, enhancing the opportunities for women uh, in science and, and engineering most uh, generally. I've been uh, thinking about this for some time and uh, I think I know a few things that are important. I will list these in, in order and I won't cover these in great detail. These are great topics for you for Saturday. Uh, uh, but like some notions. Uh, I, I would say the most important thing is support from the top. Have it, whether it's the company president or the president of the university department head, uh, people at that level that set the tone for them to say that there's a place for women in uh, a field, computer science or whatever it is, is very, very important. The second important area is what I call existence theorems. The fact that there has been one or more, or a few, uh, that have been ex successful in the past. It's a proof that it can be done. <laughs> and it's a proof to the young person it can be done, and it's a proof to the boss when he hires you that you can do the job. So it's a proof all around. It's a very important thing. We have to pay attention to it. Uh, the third item is pipeline issues. That's a subject that we do rather poorly in, in the United States uh, because we give youngsters too much choice and they choose themselves out of taking the right proper background. Thank you. <laughs> uh, taking the right background uh, courses that would be needed, say, starting college to have a career in many interesting fields that uh, uh, are going with the times. Uh, so uh, if we don't have youngsters that have the qualifications to study whatever it is, computer science or physics uh, in university, uh, those people are just not going to uh, get very far in those fields and not knowing that background will hold them up in many other careers. Now I believe that, that some background in computer science is necessary in almost any career uh, anywhere. So people studying computer science are not studying just to become professionals in computer science, but to do many other things. And the same, I'd say, is for physics, but uh, maybe less number of years of study might be uh, uh, necessary in that case. Uh, uh, next item uh, that's important is recruitment and ten retention at the college level. Uh, once people come in, to give them the right support and uh, mentoring and whatever it takes to get them through the system because uh, the main factor of, of non-completion of degrees is not uh, ability but it's other factors and so we have to pay attention to what those other factors are and try to uh, provide some support. Uh, the fifth item is uh, enhancing career opportunities after you finally get your degree. It's uh, if, if there's nothing to do, and uh, in Grace Hopper's time and even, even my time, uh, when I completed my PhD, my PhD um, sponsor, mentor said, well, all the training that, I, that we've given you, so it's a big waste of time anyhow, you're never going to do anything with your degree. And uh, I believed him. 
you know, what, what else? And here's this guy uh, telling me that I wasn't going to do anything uh, in, in the field of physics. And uh, so who was I to say? And uh, he was terribly upset every time I would get an award or a fellowship or it. <laughs> and, and, and the argument obviously was that I was taking uh, resources away from people that were going to do something later. <laughs> and uh, I think that we've come some way from that, uh, but we still have a ways to go. I don't think that we've totally won the battle. So uh, enhancing career opportunities after the degree, after completing university training, is something that we still have to work on. And then finally, breaking through the glass ceiling. And um, maybe I'll just say a few things about some of these. Uh, and I want to quit because uh, it's, I think, nice to have time for questions and answers. And I think support from, from the top I think that's pretty obvious what that is. Uh, it's not only uh, uh, important to have the uh, uh, president of the company uh, uh, support women, but there has to be some action also. Uh, I think that Anita's idea of supporting sisters, that might be a gesture. But uh, actually, digital equipment has been very good in other ways, and, uh, and we know that from the university side as well. Uh, the existence uh, uh, theorems, uh, that can occupy you uh, uh, mightily on Saturday. Uh, this conference is a good example of existence theorems. You've seen a whole day, a whole series of, of successful women and all the wonderful things that they have been doing. Um, uh, other existence theorems might be your faculty uh, members, uh, the various vice presidents, I think, that, that you have on your panel on, on, on Saturday. You have an abundance of, of uh, existence theorems here. Um, uh, encouraging young people, well, we're doing that, we're bringing in young folks here to uh, uh, meet each other. I think that's an important item, and to, uh, to see that you're not unique, that there are many of you out there, and uh, you, there are opportunities for you. Uh, recruitment and, and uh, uh, retention, well, I guess I've been working on that one for a long time. And uh, the main thing there, I'd say, in, in summary, is leveling the playing field. So when uh, men and women en enters at the entry point, that the hurdles, that is the activation energy necessary for the degree is about the same for both. And it hasn't been quite like that uh, historically. So uh, we have to address that. Uh, enhancing career opportunities. I uh, wanted to make some uh, one comment, make sure that that's covered at the conference, is uh, publicizing success stories is something that we're doing very well at this conference. We have a, uh, a, the speakers and discussion and, and so forth, and we have a, a, a panel on women and management. I think that's important. And I hope that one thing that's said is that just having some senior women around, they don't have to say anything. There, if you have a committee of 10 people and you're talking about whatever it is and there's a woman around sitting on the committee, the behavior is just different than if there's no woman there. I've seen this many times and, and in the absence of it because I, people tell me. Uh, so that if you're on uh, a selection committee, like for an award, and women, senior women get asked to do this all the time because nowadays because they like to have that, that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> I don't have to say anything in favor of women. I'd be just absolutely neutral. But we have women that are selected. And about the percentage is that they're there. And, uh, and that doesn't always happen. So uh, th that's why I'm saying that it's important to get women to move up the management uh, uh, line uh, just as symbols, even if they don't do much about it. <laughs> Just being there is impor important. Okay, that's, that's, I hope that that's stated. Uh, breaking through the glass ceiling is the last uh, item that I wanted to say. Uh, I did realize that we'd have it, no, Anita Jones here tonight, but I wanted to, to make this comment. This was part I, of, of what I had planned that uh, uh, something remarkable has happened in this administration is that women have actually uh, made a quantum jump from uh, their representation in leadership positions in the, in, in the national scene. 
And we have a whole bunch of them. Of course, we have Anita Jones heading up R&D for the DOD. But we have other people uh, as well as my good friend and colleague, Sheila Widnall, as the first uh, uh, secretary of the Air Force, the first time a woman has been secretary of a, of a military operation. And uh, Mary Good in commerce is another uh, very powerful person here in Washington, and Arati Pr Prabhakar and up in, uh, in NIST, and Martha Kreps in the Department of Energy. Um, these are all science type people um, in leadership positions. And now we have the challenge to have some comparable uh, assembly of people in the private sector. I don't think we have quite the same proportion, but I think this is a good symbol. And uh, I think that things will follow from that that will be quite remarkable. And I think maybe that's a good place to stop and have some questions and answers. And, and uh, I also apologize for the bad numbers. I'll try to get them <laughs> improved. <laughs> I'm embarrassed about having bad numbers. <laughs> yes. Well, I have some numbers. Um, oh, good. And the 20% is probably true, but unfortunately, about 10, 15 years ago, it was 33 to 35%. Um, uh, it, the bachelor's level. At the bachelor's level, and it's gone down precipitously in the last few years, and nobody quite understands why. Um, <coughs> PhDs, it's been about 12, between 12 and 13, up to 14 percent one year, but it's been pretty much flat again since 1983. Whereas in all the other sciences, it's been going up you know, and with women, and nobody quite understands why we haven't gone up like the other sciences. And as far as faculty position goes, it's been about six, seven percent, but that is increasing. So that's the good news. It's low, it's much lower than the percentage of PhDs, but at least it's increasing at the faculty level. Well, I think the thing that you want to look at is not the percentage, but you want to look at the percentage hires because uh, you have sort of a pipeline system. Yeah. That's very encouraging news. Next question. My second question is, if you believed your advisor when he told you you wouldn't do anything, how did you get here? <laughs> That's good, good, good point. Uh, uh, comparable numbers in physics, I'll do that one first. Uh, at the undergraduate level, uh, you, in computer science is 20 percent and uh, physics is 15 percent. The PhD, you, you are 13 percent and physics is 10 or 11 between. 10 and 11. Uh, faculty positions, we're half of what you are. We're, I think, about 4 percent, 3 to 4 percent. Uh, we're the lowest in the whole world, <laughs> faculty <laughs> positions in physics uh, for women in the U.S., lowest. Very uh, shameful situation. Um, but I, I think things are, are just in the very last few years, since 1990s, they, there's some improvement, uh, just, but it's at, it comes at a time when the, the prospects for employment in physics are awful. And so it's going to be some time before um, the a absolute numbers will change much because there just aren't jobs in that field. Uh, okay, that, that's a quick answer to the first question. The second question was how I got here. Uh, well, having a good husband is, the, I think, the key to it for me. <laughs> uh, he encouraged me to not quit. So that was um, point number one. And uh, for probably the first 10 years, I was uh, uh, doing physics for the love of it. I didn't think I had a future. Uh, I had a, a research job at, uh, at Lincoln Lab, and I was doing solid state physics that I, you know, those days you could get research jobs that were basic research, uh, which was just absolutely wonderful. They almost don't exist today. Um, I was in a field that was uh, growing at a very rapid rate. There were few people out there that had proper training in this field. I was one, one of a small number at that time. So I had a very good opportunity to get started. 
I didn't take myself seriously because I didn't think there was any career opportunity, so I was just working away, doing my thing and having the time of my life. And then all of a sudden I got an offer, a full professor at MIT, just, you know, just out of the blue. So uh, <laughs> that's how I got here. <laughs> Not, not facetious. Uh, a actually, uh, uh, the reason I, I, I made the transition is, is, is because uh, it has to do with children. Uh, uh, my attendance record at, at, at Lincoln Lab was, was rather poor. We were supposed to punch in our time clock at 8.30 in the morning, and with four young children, it was very difficult to get there by 8.30. So I was always late, and I got a lot of harassment for being late. And uh, so I, um, in relief of that, I decided to spend a semester on sabbatical. <laughs> so I, one of my friends invited me down to MIT to spend a semester on sabbatical, and I never left. I, I, I remained at MIT. I got <laughs> offer and remained. So that, that was the story of how it happened. And you comment on women in leadership positions University system, especially the, the leading research system. Yes, well, the, the question uh, Nita Jones asks about women in leadership positions in universities, in, uh, in particular the major research universities. Uh, years ago, uh, it was measure zero, absolutely measure zero. I was the first tenured woman faculty at MIT in the whole engineering school, first. You know, and that's not so long ago. Not that long ago. And Barbara, maybe you were the second. Uh, 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 maybe Sheila was the second. Yeah. She was a junior faculty person when I arrived. Uh, that how do how, what was the transition? Uh, at a research university, uh, the faculty members are uh, king or queen. And w w whatever, and uh, I believe that that there was essentially no discrimination. I mean, I didn't feel discrimination at MIT when I assumed a faculty position. When Barbara uh, joined the faculty in 1972, I was uh, associate department head of electrical engineering. That's a huge department at MIT, very prestigious department. And uh, now somebody just asked me to do that job. And I was a lab director of a very, very large laboratory shortly after that. And uh, now I, I, I never asked for that. I mean, it just happened. And I think that, the, and I was uh, uh, chairman of an all-male department, head of an all-male laboratory. I was the only female there, and I was the head of the laboratory. You know. So uh, I think it could happen. And now it's, it's quite common. Because uh, there's been existence theorems around the country. You know, the labs didn't fall apart uh, while we headed them. And uh, I prided myself. I went out for every single competition I was out there to win. And I usually did. And uh, you know, we, we work at it. And uh, we really work at it. And we, uh, we do the extra mile. And I think that people began to understand that. And, um, we, well, I suppose that if you were going to do numerology, that uh, according to level and uh, the percentages of, of women going through the pipeline, the number in leadership positions is less than you would, what you would expect. And that's also true in industry. And, but uh, having people like you be successful in important positions will help make normalize that number so that we don't have 0.6, but it's 1.0. You know, there's no normalization factor that the people in various positions are there in proportion to their numbers. I, I think that's going to happen in a very short time. Um, I, I, my dream was when I first came to MIT, when we had 4% women in the whole institute, uh, was that we would get to 20% in my lifetime. I did a rough back of the envelope calculation, and I thought that was the possibilities, and we've far, far exceeded that. So, uh, and I think we've exceeded in any projection I've made and anything that I could think of, we've 
grow much faster than I could imagine. And so I, I, I think that it's not that far away. Uh, now, I, I think that one of the big things that, that will help us, okay, I'm, let's be very serious about this, is uh, getting women in, in senior positions uh, and being in, uh, leaders. Uh, uh, we ha we're getting now um, uh, women entrepreneurs and uh, women heads of small companies. It hasn't happened yet in the large companies. They do, uh, on average, have a different style. I, I recently had a, a, a workshop at MIT that I, I hosted on women entrepreneurs because I wanted to find out what's different between them and, and men entrepreneurs. <laughs> and, well, most of the stuff is the same, but they do have different ideas about how to deal with uh, the people, people issues, and people that work for them. And they're rather sensitive to the needs of employees. And they claim that by, uh, understanding the family structure and family relations, they can get more work out of their employees. And uh, they do have a different attitude toward women with families and raising kids and all of that. Uh, there was a decided difference. And as we get more of those people into the workforce, I think that there will be some differences. Looks like it's getting time for uh, wrapping this up and going on to Yes, one more question? Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could comment a bit on the committee you've been uh, participating in on physics as a, as a beneficiary of that because you visited our physics department at Harvard. I thought it would be interesting for people to hear oh, a little okay. bit about it. Um, okay, I'll be very brief. It's been, it's, um, I've seen visiting committee reports and we did a report on women in science, but the focus of and the benefit of having women, senior women physicists visit the physics department has been tremendous. So it might be um, interesting for all of us to hear about Yes, that. thank you, Barbara. Thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to comment on this. I'd like to preface uh, this uh, with a, a different comment before I answer your question. Uh, I've most of this discussion has been about extracurricular activities. I had this and I had that and I do this and that. But I'm really a research scientist taking care of my students. That's what I'm really doing 90% of the time. This is just little fun and games on the side. Uh, uh, but uh, s since there are so few senior women in my field, you know, just sort of measure zero type things, the few of us there, we have to do our uh, we have to swing our weight around, you know, we have to do the work. And uh, when you call up a woman and ask her to do something, if I call up another woman physicist, I'm busy today, I can't do this, can you help me? I get 100% practically, almost, 99.44, 100%. Uh, <laughs> acceptance, yes, we'll do it. And uh, I'm, I couldn't, I wouldn't expect that of men. I wouldn't even call them. <laughs> <laughs> To, on, on that kind of a basis and expect, but you know, they feel like me, we, this, this great commitment that we have to do something. Now, uh, the, the Barbara Gross uh, uh, asked me about a committee that I was um, uh, chairing. This wasn't my idea to do this, uh, but I was asked to do this, and they, there was nobody else that practically could do it, so I, I got stuck with the job. But I, it, it's been a very interesting job. And uh, this is trying to figure out why women are doing so poorly uh, through the pipeline and, and in, uh, in careers in physics. Uh, and um, uh, this was commissioned by the department heads of all the physics departments in the U.S. This happened about four years ago. And we've been undertaking uh, a study of uh, physics departments in the, in the country. Well, we do this by sampling because we obviously can't visit uh, 200 departments, it's too many. But uh, we are visiting 15 and we've completed visits of 14 and Harvard University was one of them. Uh, uh, we don't uh, only visit elite departments, we have a, a distribution of different kinds. We have uh, private uni research universities, state universities, um, we had women's college, we had, we try to get some kind of spectrum to understand what, what's happening with women in physics. And uh, we have learned a lot of things by doing uh, this um, uh, visit. Mo mo most of what we've learned uh, is what we already sort of knew, 
but we didn't have it documented. And as we go around in the different departments, we have questionnaires where the students uh, uh, respond, undergraduates, graduate students, we talk to the faculty. And so we have a huge amount of data now, and uh, the data that was collected by American Institute of Physics in support of our work covers another order of magnitude of people beyond the schools that we visited. And uh, the picture that emerges um, is very interesting. Uh, and to summarize, faculty often perceive their responsibilities very narrowly. They think that their job ends when they finish their class or they take care of the graduate student and he's got a degree, he or she has a degree. But there's a little bit more to it. And uh, the, the, that part, uh, many of them abdicate responsibility. And we heard a lot of complaints of the students uh, about this, and that's part of the reason why uh, they leave the field. Uh, now, some of this uh, has to do uh, with inability to know the broad uh, job market possibilities. It, the obvious in physics is to get a be like your professor and do exactly what what he or she is doing and be uh, a, a researcher at a university. But there's an industry out there, and there are many places where physics could be useful that have not been used have not used physics before, and. Uh, uh, I think the young people have more ideas about this than the faculty, although the young people look to the faculty to give them suggestions. And uh, mu much of this is not forthcoming. In fact, you, they get a very negative message. And the message that uh, we, this is an aggregate summary of many schools, is that the better the university, the more negative the signal that the student gets from the professor. And, uh, uh, because the expectations of the professors are so high, they, they, the students feel that they're not good enough. And so the, at the very top universities, we had a larger fraction of the students getting the message from the professors that they were not good enough for careers in physics. And of course, obviously, if you do the aggregate around the country, that's not what they should be saying. And, um, and the other uh, main thing is uh, that the students perceive that the professors uh, are only happy with them if they uh, go into careers just like what they were doing, and that obviously is not going to be possible, and certainly not for the next little bit of time. So uh, I think that uh, uh, aside from these sort of macro things that, that, that we learned, uh, we, we have been working with the various departments identifying specific things that they can do to improve their uh, situation. Uh, a few schools, uh, I'd say that the schools we visited by and large were the be best schools because they invited us specifically to come to see how good they were. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, many of the schools that we were not invited to uh, are doing much worse. And uh, we know that, but uh, that's not going to be in the report, obviously, <laughs> because, you know, we have no data but except for the aggregate. I don't know if that's a very good uh, uh, answer, but uh, uh, perhaps the computer science people uh, might think about this approach in, in trying to understand uh, uh, what's happened to their situation in the last uh, bit of time. Uh, the AWIS organization ha uh, has been impressed by what we're doing, and they're mounting uh, uh, visiting programs in biology, chemistry, and mathematics to model our program, but they don't have one in computer science. So I don't know if you uh, might take a variant of what, just see what we come up with and what's good about it and try to improve on what we've started. I mean, we're not uh, uh, social scientists, uh, uh, but uh, to do a survey in physics, uh, it can't be done by social scientists, really. You have to have somebody that gets the attention of the, uh, of the faculty. So it has to have somebody with the research credentials that's at least or comparable to the people you're visiting. Otherwise, you make absolutely no progress in physics. I'm not sure wh whether computer science is, is different, but it's probably similar. Yeah. Well, I think, is there anything else that I have to do? <laughs> uh, okay.